is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardere broadcasting from the International Bariatric Club Studios in San Diego, California. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery exclusive event is Bariatric Metabolic Surgery and the Military. And we'll feature experts from the United States, Norway, Greece, Sweden, Switzerland, Israel, and Turkey. We would like to thank our partners, Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, Facebook, Bariatric News, Cinemet, and Explore Surgical for setting up, promoting, and accrediting this webinar, which is sponsored by our platinum sponsors, Ethicon Endosurgery, Conmed, Medtronic, Lexington Medical, CMR Surgical, Easy Surge Medical, David Medical, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, Arthrex, Fit Forum, WL Gore, Reach Surgical, Carl Stortz, Bariatric Solutions, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquiband Fix 8, Bang Medical, our silver sponsors, USGI Medical, Mass Bariatric Technologies, Richard Wolf, our bronze sponsors, Intuitive Surgical, Baxter, Apollo Endosurgery. This 35th IBC Oxford University webinar is streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and via IBC Instagram. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon, co-founder of the IBC, and director of IBC Global Education, based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London, and Christchurch, Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Richard Peterson from the United States, and will be moderated by Professor Scott Shikora and Dr. Eric Anfeld, both from the United States. And now let me present our co-chair, Professor Richard Peterson from the United States. He is Chief of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and Professor of Surgery at the University of Texas Health, San Antonio. He's past president of the Texas State Chapter of the ASMBS, also past chair of the Communications Committee, Public Education Committee, and Program Committee of the ASMBS. He is social media editor for SWORD founder of Sword Journal Club on Facebook and formerly active duty service in the United States Air Force, formerly consultant for bariatric surgery to the U.S. Air Force Surgeon General and ran the largest bariatric surgery program in the United States Department of Defense. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much, Ariel. I appreciate it. Thank you to the IBC. Ariel, thank you. It's good to see you again. It's been a long time. Uh, it's great to be here with this whole uh, panel and uh, all of our presenters today. So I'm very excited uh, to be a part of this. And of course, thank you to Harris uh, for the uh, invite and opportunity. I love it. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for being with us today. Let me present our moderators today. I'm going to start by presenting Lieutenant Colonel Eric Anfield from the United States. He is Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, active duty since June 2004. He's former general surgeon to Darnell Army Medical Center at Fort Hood, Texas, member of the SAGES Military Working Group, inaugural chair of the Military Committee for ASMBS, serves as a liaison between the Defense Health Agency and ASMBS. He has been deployed to Iraq twice, Afghanistan twice, Puerto Rico for Hurricane Maria, and Kosovo. He is also General Surgery Residency Program Director at William Beaumont Army Medical Center from 2015 to 2020 and Chief of Surgical Services for the 519th Hospital Center at Lundstall Regional Medical Center. Welcome, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Anfield. Thank you, Ariel. It's great to hear from you. I'm broadcasting from a field of firemen. So if you don't hear me, that's okay. But I really appreciate it and I'm honored by the invitation. Thank you. It's our pleasure to have you here. And last but not least, Professor Scott Shikora, Professor of Surgery, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard University in the United States, President-elect of IFSO, past president of the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, editor-in-chief of Obesity Surgery, and also former staff surgeon of the United States Air Force. Welcome, Professor Scott Shikora. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. I was mentioning earlier that I'm in awe of this panel. And for those of you past military and uh, active military, on behalf of someone who did my time as well, thank you for your service. Thank you, Scott. All right, I'm going to pass it on directly to Professor Richard Peterson, who's going to present our first speaker. 
Thank you, Ariel. I appreciate that. And again, I would love the sentiment uh, that Dr. Shakur mentioned as well. Thank you, everyone who has served. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, we're going to start off with our very first talk uh, by uh, Dr. Tamara Wilson. Uh, she the, is going to be talking about should the policy against bariatric surgery for active duty military personnel in the United States change. And as an introduction, Dr. Uh, Worlton is an associate professor of surgery at Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, also known as USIS. Uh, she's a medical, metabolic and bariatric surgery director and director of global surgery at Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. As well, she has served as a ship surgeon on an aircraft carrier deployed to Afghanistan, Djibouti, and served on both U.S. Navy hospital ships and most recently responded to the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City. Thank you, Dr. Walton. For your time today. Thank you so much for that introduction um, and thank you to Harris and the rest of the uh, International Bariatric Club for uh, inviting me to talk about this topic that I think we're all uh, very excited about. Um, let me see if I can get this. There we go. So um, I've been doing mostly bariatric surgery uh, in the military for just over a decade. Um, and so this is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I know that the frustration from surgeons, from patients, from service members and their direct leadership in regards to this policy is very real. Uh, this is the standard disclaimer. Um, the, I just wanna add that my bias in this is a US-based policy. Uh, and then even within that, my knowledge of the Navy uh, and the Navy policies are more uh, than the other services. So I'm glad that we have a uh, tri-service representation here. So this is the actual policy that dictates uh, service members' ability to receive bariatric surgery. This was released in 2007, uh, and there's not been an alteration or update since that time. When you read this policy a little uh, more carefully, it's a short policy, it highlights some of the rationale uh, behind this decision and some of the hard lines that the military has drawn about service members and bariatric surgery. Uh, I'd like to take you through some of these statements more in depth to determine if they really are as clear cut uh, as it is stated in this policy. So behind all this, I believe that there is this perception that it's part of the job description for military members to be in shape. This is a very common perception uh, and even some of our own active duty uh, bariatric surgeons believe the same thing. Uh, and maybe even some of our discussion panel will too. So this might be an exciting discussion later. Uh, it should come as no surprise to anyone listening to this talk that the prevalence of obesity in the US and worldwide has continued to rise. Uh, and that does not uh, exempt the military population. Uh, there are some service specific differences, which in my opinion reflect the core mission and the total force uh, of the service. So another common uh, misperception is that military service is constantly physically demanding, uh, but I'd have to say that this is a little bit closer to reality. Most military jobs are administrative, involve a lot of sedentary work. Additionally, many service members are required to stand watch, uh, which is typically 12 hours with minimal breaks and even less activity. And it is fueled by Mountain Dew and candy uh, for our 18 to 20 year olds that stand watch. Uh, one of the things that the policy discusses is that the military offers a multidisciplinary uh, approach to weight loss. Um, in the Navy, a physical fitness assessment or a PFA is conducted twice annually, which includes a body composition analysis, which has a maximum weight uh, based on height that also differs between uh, the services. This is the current uh, Navy chart if anyone was interested in it. Uh, failure of either the physical fitness test or the body composition analysis puts the service member into a mandatory fitness fitness enhancement program three times a week. There is a minimal component of dietary and no behavioral health intervention at this time. Uh, in fact, the body weight failures undergo one dietary session where they are told to eat just 500 calories per day, something that very few people would be successful maintaining long term. Uh, additionally, not all military hospitals uh, have consistent nutrition uh, and behavioral health offerings. The Navy, at least, is consistently short on registered dietitians. Uh, even here at Walter Reed, uh, where we have excellent resources, uh, we have a great multidisciplinary group for integrated wellness uh, that does non-surgical weight loss counseling. Uh, but the demand far ex out uh, exceeds the resources, even if you just limit it to active duty, which, of course, in this uh, circumstance, it is not. 
So I'd like to pause here and discuss another refrain that you might hear, uh, eating your way out of the military, implying that people will intentionally gain weight to be discharged from service. I was actually accused of this at the end of my surgical residency training when I was struggling with my own weight uh, with long hours and, and taking call uh, by my hospital leadership. So I can tell you that that was not the intention and uh, this is not a viable solution for getting out of the military early. So what does it mean for um, a service member to not make weight? Even the language around weight control in the military is fraught with obvious bias. The failure of a height weight measure is severely detrimental to one's career, even if it has no impact on job performance in most cases. In fact, uh, just about a decade ago, the military initiated a two failures, uh, two weight failures, and you are out of the military, even if those failures were not consecutive. So this constant uh, consciousness about one's weight and what it will mean to your career is very draining. Uh, this constant pressure is a breeding ground for eating disorders, uh, which are difficult to diagnose and treat due to the mental health stigma uh, in the military. So uh, there has been several studies about this uh, and across um, three of them, the uh, rates of binge eating in women in the military was about 19%, which is higher than uh, the 12 to 16% in college aged women. Another study by Jake Jacobson et al. showed about 5.5% of women uh, have a eating disorder pre-deployment, and then 3.3% of them will develop a new onset disorder if screened again in one to five years. Uh, and for men, it was 4% at baseline and 2.6% uh, at follow-up. A survey also found that 5% of service members use purging behavior before a weigh-in and 18% reported laxatives, diuretics, and diet pills. Uh, the Navy used to weigh in uh, directly before the physical fitness testing, but they uh, people would pass out due to dehydration because of these measures that they have uh, uh, underwent to, to try and make their weight. So the Navy actually changed the weigh-in from one to 45 days before the physical fitness test, uh, which is really ignoring this behavior and not addressing it. So the military also uh, not only kind of ignores uh, this, but also creates an environment that enables and encourages binging food. Uh, not only is the food offered in deployment, shown here, <laughs> is often low quality and lacking in fresh fruits and vegetables. There are mountains of care packages that we receive. There's candy and cookies and treats and snacks and chips all over uh, the MWR, uh, all over uh, the chapel and in, in um, uh, most places uh, in, the, in the ship or on deployment. Also on the ship, not only do we have our food provided for us, uh, but we have stores on the ship. Uh, there are half, the, half of the store is junk food and the other half is t-shirts and shaving cream. Uh, and that's there to help those uh, sailors drink that Mountain Dew and eat that candy to stay awake while on watch. And of course, with every meal, there is dessert. In fact, what do you do when morale is low? You have an ice cream social. Uh, you need a treat in Afghanistan, you get some Baskin Robbins. And this is literally how it is treated uh, in every deployment that I've been on. So it should be clear by now that uh, just by being in the military and even having the resources of the military does not prevent obesity. Uh, additionally, the military sends mixed signals for, um, at best, for using food as an emotional crutch and then punishing service members for using that crutch. Uh, finally, the military uh, stigmatizes weight in a way that may prevent service members from getting the help that they need. So let's talk about that second uh, thing that the policy discussed, which is uh, bariatric surgery prevents the service member from deploying worldwide. So again, I go back to thinking about food. Uh, so there are special dietary requirements, uh, as we all know, uh, post-bariatric surgery, and this can be difficult. Uh, in the Navy, we have a 21-day uh, menu that rotates when you're on deployment, um, and there is supposed to have uh, at least one item that is less than 15 grams of fat. Um, this was my attempt uh, at a plant-based diet on this ship. <laughs> all cooked vegetables were a little bit of a trap uh, because they were were uh, mostly slathered in butter. <laughs> Every Tuesday is Taco Tuesday. Every Wednesday is Burger and Fries Day. And Saturday we called Fatter Day because it is pizza and wings every single rotating week. Uh, despite this, I do believe that in the, ma the vast majority of circumstances, service members can and will have protein supplementation uh, if they want and they can take their vitamins with them. 
So what other medical conditions make you non-deployable? Uh, so referencing the Army medical disqualifiers, you can see that obesity in and of itself and its related uh, conditions is a disqualification. And so when you look at surgery, uh, it's actually very open-ended about disqualification. Uh, I have personally done uh, bowel surgery. I did an ileostachectomy on a deployed patient for perforated appendicitis, and that patient was back to the deployed environment within a couple of weeks. So intestinal surgery in and of itself is not a disqualification for deployment. And I think part of this concern is about post-operative uh, bariatric patients being deployed, that there may not be the resources there uh, to care for them wherever they are. Uh, and this also manifests um, in our family members of active duty who have had bariatric surgery and need to get screened to move overseas. It is often difficult to convince US physicians in Japan or Italy uh, that a post-op bariatric patient isn't a ticking time bomb waiting for just complications to appear. Uh, even if there are are unanticipated complications. There are local surgeons who are um, comfortable taking care of bariatric surgeons, uh, bariatric patients. And so I think that this is not quite as a uh, strict uh, reason to not deploy patients. And finally, not everyone deployed in uh, is in the military and under the same restrictions uh, in regards to bariatric surgery. In 2009, uh, contractors actually outnumbered the active military in Iraq. And in 2016, one in four US persons in Iraq and Afghanistan was a private contractor. I personally know contractors in Afghanistan and Djibouti that had bariatric surgery and were still eligible to mobilize worldwide. So I think that we, we just established that the concern for deploying service members worldwide is a little exaggerated. Uh, and we called into question how unavailable or ineffective the policies um, the policies discussed multidisciplinary weight management is in reality for service members. Both of these uh, address the concerns expressed directly in the policy. Sorry. Uh, and now we're going to focus on additional reasons why the policy should change. So the US military is an all volunteer force uh, that makes up about 0.09% of the total US population, but it's still over 1.3 million individuals. Uh, we examined the rates of obesity in the US already, uh, but this puts about a quarter of young people ineligible to serve solely due to weight, uh, even if they wanted to. Uh, so there is increasing difficulty in meeting recruitment numbers. And once somebody is in the uh, military, the obesity related uh, healthcare costs and uh, days lost, work days lost due to overweight and obese is substantial. And I think it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that the military lifestyle uh, impacts long term health, particularly in regards to acute and cumulative traumatic injury. Uh, in fact, this uh, increased trauma, particular to particularly to the lower extremities, makes it more difficult for uh, senior military members to be active and to lose weight. And uh, although the rates of type 2 diabetes in the active force have decreased uh, from 2008 to 2018, it is still a significant contributor to morbidity in the force. Uh, a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and a hemoglobin A1C of over 7, uh, despite lifestyle modifications or if you're not able to take um, medical therapy for it, is referred automatically to a medical evaluation board. A medical evaluation board is the first step from uh, processing uh, to process someone to medically separate them from the military. And you look at this chart, the new diagnosis of diabetes happened most frequently in the 40 plus age range. This is also where we find our highest prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea, remembering that both of these conditions uh, potentially prevent uh, deployment in and of themselves and can be treated by bariatric surgery. So as a member of the over 40 club, there are age ranges. These are the age ranges where experience and expertise uh, that is necessary to train and lead the next generation is concentrated. All services have acknowledged that they're in a war for talent uh, as the desire to join the military is declining and the military pay is just not competitive in the current economy. Often the talent pool is small for highly specialized jobs in cybersecurity uh, and other tech industries, which is desperately needed in the US military. Training new people takes time and money. And in fact, this is the population that we as bariatric surgeons often get calls about uh, to see how we can help the service member make weight so they, the command can retain their talent. 
So should the US military reconsider the reasoning behind prohibiting life-saving surgery that can improve service members' health, increase their capacity to deploy, and enhance retention in an all-volunteer force? Yes, I think that they should. Uh, I think, so in um, 2012, 19 of 19% of applicants to all services were medically disqualified for service, and the majority of these are for weight. Uh, unfortunately, most people do not pursue a medical waiver, and if they do, the waiver is processed by a recruiter, not by a medical professional. There is also the option to pursue a waiver for bariatric surgery prior to military enlistment, which most potential recruits and recruiters do not know about. While I agree that not all uh, military specialties or career tracks may be conducive to bariatric surgery, the vast majority of them are, uh, particularly with the emphasis in trying to recruit a diverse force with an emphasis in the science fields. Uh, I appreciate that the Air Force website said there isn't enough data to support bariatric surgery in the military uh, population. So if data is what we're lacking, then we need to be able to research this issue in the services. Um, and I think before that, we need to address the punitive mu uh, military culture that surrounds weight and mental health. Uh, education is key, and there are so many strong advocates for bariatric surgery in the military, particularly present today. Um, and so, uh, and after that, we can do the research needed. And uh, that is all from me. Thank you so much. Tamara, that was great. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, I obviously feel a lot of the, the issues that are going on. I have, I have one kind of two-part question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, and that is, what do you think is the biggest barrier to getting your message to higher command? And the second is, what's the, in your opinion, the best mechanism for changing this policy? Yeah, so I, I tried to outline, uh, outline a little bit of a strategy because I know that um, certainly we've had advocacy through ASMBS um, and through SAGES uh, to try and bring this message um, to leadership. And even with that, even with my own patients, I, I've uh, had patients on the National Security Council asking me, why aren't we doing this so that we can uh, uh, retain people in the service that we desperately need? Uh, and I've written white papers about it. And, and it seems that there is a disconnect. Um, personally, I think that the services like using this because it is a opportunity to have a reduction in force. Um, so they change the height weight requirements um, and put things like two to uh, body weight uh, failures uh, and you're out of the service. Um, so I, I, I feel like it's an easy way for them to uh, drop um, numbers. And then I, I yeah, uh, the, I think it's so well established um, the efficacy of uh, bariatric surgery. And I don't know why there's that mental disconnect between saying that People in uniform are the genetically the same as the people not in uniform uh, within a country, and that you should benefit from that uh, from the same uh, treatment. If I can make a comment, just to put things a little bit in perspective, uh, when I was in the military from ninety one to ninety five, I was performing bariatric surgery at uh, Wilford Hall we were only allowed to operate on dependents. We could not operate on anybody on active duty because by definition at the time, if they weighed enough to require bariatric surgery, they were basically dismissed from the military. And we created the first program. Uh, I went there myself and the only reason I dabbled in it was because no one else was doing it and they were doing some VBGs on uh, dependents. And I had come from a program where I had learned to do bariatric surgery and I needed it to just do GI surgery because otherwise as the low men on totem pole, I wasn't gonna have a lot of business in the military with uh, doing performing surgery. In any event, we brought a nurse into the program. We brought a dietitian and a pharmacist who was uh, interested in the care of uh, patients would round with us. And uh, that's where I think it was one of the earliest programs in the military to start. But, you know, you're looking at this and saying we haven't gone far enough. And I completely agree with you. 
I'm thinking back to say how far you've come from where I was at the time that we were doing bariatric surgery. It was a whole different world. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, in researching this talk, I did come across um, a paper by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Matt Martin, who did a bunch of open Ruin Y gastric bypasses on active duty uh, service members uh, pre this policy. Um, and I'm not sure how if they got local command release uh, from it to do that. Um, and I didn't bring it in here because they said that patients deployed after the surgery, but they didn't have any numbers uh, about it. But showed that it was successful and they they were able to stay on active duty. And so I think that. I feel like that's really, if that's what they need, then we need to be able to uh, do a study where we're able to offer this and then we follow patients longitudinally and see if there's issues deploying. I think that if we define clear cut uh, military career paths that are, uh, that are um, suitable uh, for bariatric surgery, which is the vast majority of them, uh, then that makes it easier. So we say, well, if you wanna go into special operations, uh, SEAL training school, EOD, any of that stuff, maybe that you're, this isn't the time to do you do that first, but starting with like the staff corps, uh, lawyers, doctors, <laughs> we're, we're, we're the low hanging fruit as far as uh, being able to, to do these surgeries and, and uh, prove that we can be um, viable and uh, successful military officers afterwards or, and, and uh, enlisted as well. Well, Thank you both. Uh, thank you everyone for that. I was going to take a minute and introduce, begin the introduction of our panel. Uh, I'm going to start off with four of our eight panelists as I, I introduce them. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Rolton. That's a, it was a great talk. And I, I uh, would like to echo what Dr. Shakora was saying. I, I actually uh, took over the Wilford Hall program, two surgeons past Dr. Uh, Shakora. So uh, I totally understand that policy. And uh, to your point, um, you know, at, at one time we were treating weight and today that's not what our surgery is treating anymore. It's treating so many other of these comorbidities. And so uh, we have a lot of diabetic folks and things like that that would probably benefit from this. So I want to start off with Dr. Uh, Farah Hussein. Uh, Dr. Hussein is an executive counsel and counsel person at large of the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. She is the division chief of bariatric surgery at Oregon Health, Sci uh, Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, she is the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the ASMBS. And she trained and served in the U.S. Army as an active duty surgeon from 2001 to 2010. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hussein. Uh, we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Michelle Suter from Switzerland, chief surgeon at the hospital uh, Rivera Chablis, uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, vice pres president of the IFSO Scientific Committee, uh, advising editor to obesity surgery, past president of IFSO European chapter, and the past president of the Swiss Society for the Study of Morbid Obesity and Metabolic Disorders. So thank you, Dr. Suter. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Phil Schauer, uh, Professor of Metabolic Surgery and Director of the Bariatric and Metabolic Institute at Pennington uh, Biomedical Research Institute of Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Formerly a Professor of Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine, past president of the ASMBS co-chair of the Diabetes Surgery Summit in 2007, 2015, and 2019, and the principal investigator of the Stampede Trial. Uh, as well, we have Professor Torsten Olvers from Sweden, professor of surgery at, uh, I'm sorry, Linkoving uh, University and senior consultant at the Department of Surgery, uh, pre previously consultant surgeon at Salgrenska University Hospital in Gothenburg, Sweden, where he developed a widely spread technique for laparoscopic Runway Gastric Bypass, together with Professor Hans Lampro, um, collaborator of the SOS, or in the SOS study, and the principal investigator for a Scandinavian randomized control trial comparing Runway Gastric Bypass and sleeve gastrectomy, known as the BEST trial. Thank you so much. I will turn it over to Dr. Onfeld to introduce the other four panelists of this uh, section. And I have the honor of introducing uh, uh, Professor Andre Kadar the chairman of the Department of Surgery at Ashuda Ashtad Public University in Ashtad, Israel. He's a professor of surgery also at uh, Ben Huron University in Israel. Um, Dr. Ben Clapp is a general and minimally invasive uh, bariatric pending surgeon at uh, Texas Tech Paul F. Foster School of Medicine, um, University Hospital in El Paso, Texas. He's the chief of surgery at Pros uh, the Providence Hospital in El Paso, Texas. He's the treasurer for the Texas Association for Bariatric Surgery from 2020 to 2022. Uh, he is on the ASMBS 
Research Committee in 2019, um, starting in 2019 and continuing on. He is also a former armor officer of the United States uh, Army Reserve and the United States National Guard for eight years. Uh, Professor Stacy Brethauer uh, is also a, a former colleague and a mentor of mine. Uh, he is a bariatric surgeon, medical director of supply chain, the vice chair of quality and patient safety, and a professor of surgery in the division of uh, surgery and gastroenterology, gastrointestinal surgery at the Ohio State. University Wexner Medical Center. He's the past president of ASMBS, um, former staff surgeon at Cleveland Clinic, where I got to know him. And he was uh, active duty from 1989 to 2005. And he's been a surgeon on aircraft carriers, was inserted in Iraq uh, with the Marines. And then also we have Dr. Angel Reyes, who's in Pacific Northwest. He's a generally, general and minimally invasive bariatric surgeon. Um, he's established bariatric surgery programs at multiple units, uh, U.S. Army locations, including Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and he's currently stationed at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington, United States. Thank you all for being here. I think it's good to hear um, what you guys have to say about these current policies as they affect um, your local uh, militaries, as well as they are affecting globally kind of the perception of what is the need for bariatric surgery or metabolic surgery within the military. Eric, I'm happy to start if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> well, one thing I think that we, we may forget is that in the civilian world, we talk a lot about obesity bias and what that leads to in our society. And I don't think we talk about that a lot in the military. Um, I, I know my time in the military, it was all about just work harder Eat, eat smarter and, and do more to lose weight. So I think obesity bias is still a big factor. And it was probably a big factor in drafting a lot of these policies because we really thought we could work people out of their weight. Uh, and if they just worked hard enough, we could do it. And so I think um, that's a factor that we have to continue to address because when you look at the statements from a lot of the leadership, it just talks about, well, if people are more disciplined, they'd be able to stay in the military. If they had a little more sense of discipline, they wouldn't face an obesity problem. And so maybe if we can step away from that a little bit and not be uh, in that state of obesity bias and not thinking of this as a true metabolic disease uh, rather than a personal choice, then that would help make some of those military decisions as well. And I think all of us have had patients who have been extremely successful. Um, ironically today, when I got to work, as I parked my car and got out of it, uh, a bike commuter rode up right next to me and parked in the bike cage got out and said, hey, Dr. Hussein. And sure enough, it was a patient I operated on about a year ago and she'd just done her you know, 20 mile bike ride into work. And I thought, well, isn't this the best of ironies? My lazy self just rolled out of my car from a fraction of her commute. <laughs> uh, and so who should really have been serving in the military at that point if that was gonna be your final determinant? Thank you, Farah. I appreciate that. Uh, what, uh, what are the, um, some of the other panelists' uh, thoughts? I mean, we obviously have a lot of folks who've served uh, um, in the military uh, on the panel as well. And I'm curious how, uh, what the international uh, sort of thoughts are as well, because uh, I'm more familiar with that policy. I remember uh, I, had a little, I had a little bit of uh, PTSD, Tara, as you put that uh, military <laughs> uh, letterhead up, and I thought I remember that policy very well. Um, and it realizing what it what it prevented us from doing, and especially you know in 2007 we weren't even recognizing obesity as a disease, and so we talk about that. I mean clearly that's a that's a change. So how do we um, how, you know how do we obviously you, you, Fair you raise a great point. It's it is a bias, and you know we shouldn't be biasing a disease. Um, you know if it was a problem, it's a problem, but that's not what it is. So what do the other panelists think about that? Yeah. Hey Rich, uh, this is Phil Shower. And, hey, Phil. And I just comment and say uh, you know I think Fair is is right. It, these policies, you know, should be based on science. Uh, and before I elaborate further, I, I do want to, um, you know, to acknowledge, uh, you know, Eric Onfeld and uh, Tamara Walton, who trained at our center in Cleveland, um, along with, you know, Stacey Bredhauer. And we're so proud of, um, you know, taking on, you know, these military surgeons and so proud of not only taking their skill back to the military, but their leadership. And so really proud of that. And, and also just a brief shout out to Monique Hassan, who was an army surgeon that trained with us uh, a few years ago, and she's now in Temple, Texas. So 
really pleased you guys have done so well uh, in your careers. But getting back to the issue of um, you know, the science, I've always been, uh, on the one hand, in awe of the military on how it has embraced science to use the tools of science to enhance the strength, you know, readiness of our military. Um, and, and so it surprises me that, you know, they really haven't caught up to understanding, you know, modern concepts about body weight regulation, metabolism, and understanding that there's an enormous variability and genetic predisposition, you know, to, to obesity and, and body weight, you know, changes. And uh, it's, it's really time that they get caught up. I'd be interested to know, perhaps, you know, Tamara or Eric could comment, you know, just on what is the process at the military of developing these policies? You know, is there a committee of, you know, of experts, of scientists who address these policies? And, you know, how often is that done? And, you know, what does it take to actually submit a request to update these guidelines that are woefully out of date. Want to take that, Tamara, or you want me to do it? Uh, I was just going to say, Congress, <coughs> Congress, <coughs> Congress. <laughs> we would need a congressional inquiry to to actually, you know, get the report, look at the science behind it, and and uh, you know, from the from the military committee. Um, that's what I would say, Eric. If you have anything else to add. <laughs> Yeah, each of the each of the service lines has uh, the Army, Navy, and Air Force have their Surgeon General representative, and um, they define policy for each of the branches of service. Those uh, those policies are reviewed then under the staff of their the Surgeon General, and then are uh, as depending on what policy as needed. And so there is some uh, there is some onus I think on the surgeon population to be able to present this concern up to the surgeon. Uh, up to the Surgeon General um, to be of each of the respective services, but indeed to change the federal policy, you would have it would have to be a congressional change at the recommendation of the Surgeon Generals. So uh, that's kind of the mechanism to change that. Now there is a couple little backdoor things, and 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 Tamara's talk talked a little bit or touched a little bit on that in terms of the indication for surgery, which I think we'll hear a little bit more on uh, a little bit later on our part two of this when we start talking about metabolic indications for surgery, um, especially as it relates to traumatic brain injury, which is really an exciting area that's opening up, but I don't want to talk about that too much. Yet. So, and, a uh, and Professor Olbers, I think you had your hand up. I apologize for having missed it. So i uh, give you an opportunity. I'm so sorry. No problem at all. I just said, uh, this is a little bit of an outsider perspective from US yeah, that um, from Scandinavia, from Sweden, but, I actually, in 20 years with bariatric surgery, never come across that any questions about a person in the military having bariatric surgery. This is actually something that hasn't crossed my path. I've, I've, it's come across with airline pilots and um, police officers uh, that uh, there's come this question, but actually not in the military. And I'm, I'm not familiar with any any legislation or any rules within the, uh, the Swedish military that would prohibit people from having bariatric surgery or, or having had bariatric surgery getting in there. In a way, I think that what I hear is a little bit of a kind of almost like a parallel society within the military where we have some turbo stigmatization about obesity in the way you are presenting it uh, in the U.S. military. It's, it's a little bit of the same, but in a kind of in a steroid perspective where you actually can get fired for, for not filling the, the weight criteria. So, so I, I, I'm just saying yeah, from my perspective that it's obviously for some individuals about if they can perform their service as required. And that should be on an individual basis, but to institutionalize such a stigma uh, seems to me quite odd. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I would, I would agree. Uh, your statements, I think, are, are well uh, taken. And I think what uh, Dr. Walton was mentioning is that the military, uh, from, from the time this was written and also from the, 
the perception it had from before, you know, it's the old black and white videos of people, you know, running and fighting and own, that's all they do. But the reality is, you know, uh, the military today is, is more sedentary because of the technology that's at our, our fingertips literally to, to do the jobs. And so uh, things may be quite different and the diseases are different. Diabetes are different. Uh, one of my deployed, uh, the surgeons who uh, shared a, a trailer with me on my first deployment, he had sleep apnea and he was not an individual who, um, you know, he was not obese. He was not even in that category. Yet, you know, he was deployable because he was an orthopedic surgeon and they needed him. Um, but it, it is how it is. The, the, their exceptions can be made. People are deployable, even if they're not globally deployable. So I think it is an interesting, you know, thought. Uh, what what are we doing? And I think that's that's the thing. It's probably time for that, uh, you know, revisualization. Um, Eric, uh, any other I think we probably have about four more minutes uh, to, to get some other comments from our panelists. Uh, yeah, I'm um, interested to hear what the perspective is from Israel, from uh, Dr. Kadav. I think you're I think on you're mute, muted, Dr. Qatar. Uh, okay, do you hear me now? We've got yes. you, thank you. Okay, I'm, uh, I was caught outside because I couldn't get in time to my office. So I, I see this as a, a serious problem in our country because Many people, many, many young uh, people want to get recruited. It is a part of a uh, patriotic uh, pathway that uh, many citizens go through. And military service is considered, uh, you know, it's a mandatory service. So many people are being discharged from military service without being uh, even uh, recruited because of the of uh, morbid obesity. So many of them who feel uh, patriotic about uh, being uh, about service come uh, ahead of time at the age of uh, 16 and 15 and 17 and they really ask to have a bariatric surgery because they want uh, they plan to be recruited they want uh, uh, to serve but uh, if they have a bmi of uh, 40 or above usually they are not uh, able to be to serve so many young people come, uh, especially boys, especially male uh, adolescents come uh, and ask uh, to, to proceed with surgery. And this is a major consideration in, in some sector of, of our population. And uh, after they, uh, they lose weight, Many of them go through and they are uh, being recruited and they really serve the full uh, military service. Still, they have a medical profile that does not allow them to serve at the highest, uh, uh, you know, there are field uh, assignment and uh, they call them, uh, we call them uh, the, the battle, battlefield uh, service. But also you can have a, a service which, which, is, uh, which is called uh, like a job. Really, that's the slang uh, variation of the, of the name of, the, of this service, that they go through the job uh, of uh, serving in the office, serving in the, on the computers. And uh, as, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, military service is not always about physical uh, activity. But uh, in our country, it's a major issue. So I think it is, it should be uh, maybe somehow, you know, I, I looked through literature and I found nothing about this. There is really zero, zero publication talking about uh, ability or uh, restriction or uh, some requirements for people who are... Uh, going to serve in the army uh, regarding the BMI, regarding the comorbidities. So I think uh, it's a good uh, field of, it could be, could be maybe studied by us. Yes, that's a good, that's a very good point. There is very little on, on the, on the policy formation in terms of data or publishing of that. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate that input, especially considering the mandatory service requirement um, that, that that Israel, I believe, still has. Is that correct? 
Eric, can I ask a question of those folks on active duty? Sure. Do yeah, you please, really Eric. think the military's decisions are made for scientific validity versus from admin person? When I was in, a lot of the policies that we were uh, subjected to always seemed to be done by someone who knew nothing about the topic. And as if I'm not mistaken, in the Vietnam War, if there was an intestinal injury and the surgeon tried to do a primary repair, they were court-martialed because the policy was everybody got a colostomy whether they needed one or not. So do you really think that currently the people making these bariatric decisions know anything about bariatric surgery? That's a very good, there's a, that's a very good uh, question. Very appropriate. And I think, I think that it, it depends. So honestly, I think it, at, at some point, someone's got to make a decision in terms of what the scientific community, and we see this right now in terms of COVID, right? We have to, we have to look at where, where the balance is between where the science is and what the policy is and the implications of the policy. So I agree that none of, it's not 100% based on science. In fact, oftentimes it's the opposite of science. Um, but I think as you're, when you look at lobbyist groups or things like that, when you start talking about congressional change of policy, that, that the ability to change those policies have to come from someplace else. It can't be, there has to be some sort of data and how that data is presented um, depends on how loud a voice you have. Sometimes it depends on how deep your pocketbooks are. And I can only speak obviously to the, to the kind of the political machine in the United States and not the politics of different countries. But, uh, how about um, how about uh, well, Eric? I was going to say, oh, yeah. uh, Ben Ben Clapp had a comment, and then I also wanted to give uh, Stacy uh, uh, a moment uh, too. So Ben, could you, uh, and then we'll go to Stacy, and then I think we might have to close this section and move on to your part, uh, Eric. So you know, it probably hasn't changed much since I was in the military. But for uh, the military, you have the combat arms, which are the infantry, the armor, and uh, artillery, and then you have pretty much everyone else, which is a combat support role. And usually it's an eight to one ratio. So having a, this idea that everybody's got to be fit enough to go to ranger school or airborne school uh, or be in the infantry is, is probably not really appropriate. And that, that point's been made, but um, I think there needs to be a little more flexibility from the military, especially with difficulty in meeting recruiting goals. So I, I think it's a great idea to start, I think at least with the recruiting um, aspect of this. Thank you. Thank you, Ben and Stacy. Yeah, thanks, Rich, and thanks, Tam, for a great talk. A um, couple of things popped, uh, got my attention as, as Tamara was talking. Um, uh, number one, you know, the policy in 2007, obviously we've got a great operation that's really emerged as a, a great uh, option since that time uh, in the sleeve gastrectomy, uh, which I think, you know, we all can all agree has, you know, far fewer potential long-term issues. Uh, and having deployed um, in a lot of different environments, I, I could not see why a patient with a sleeve gastrectomy who's in the maintenance phase could not do well in virtually any of the environments that I have been in, in, in you know, extreme heat and on the ship and so forth. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, a common sense and medical case can be made, but my, the bigger point is I, anytime, in my experience with the military, anytime you want some change, you've got to you've got to have a problem to fix and you have to, so what's the problem? What, what would you present to leadership as we have a problem with X and this is the solution. Is it recruitment? Is it uh, uh, deployability? Because if there's no problem to fix, you're really going to be uh, really running up an up uphill battle for many years to come. Um, so when, when Tamara said that there was really, it was a way to weed people out um, that got my attention because if that's the goal is to decrease the uh, force size, this is going to be a tough sell. Now, that's a really good point. Did you have to have a problem? Um, I didn't actually, you know, I, I don't want to, I actually, Dr. Uh, Reyes, you, you made a point in the chat. I just want to mention it there. You kind of raise a problem. I want you, if you may want to talk about it, but this, that these folks that we're, that we're not treating, in the active duty, when they're separating, are going to the VA system and they're getting disability. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Reyes, you want to mention a little bit about that, and then we'll, yeah. I guess, we'll move on. Yeah. So, so far, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, so, yeah, here in Madigan, we uh, we have started doing obesity medicine uh, for the dependents, and uh, typically, word of mouth gets spread, and then all these side patients are flocking into the clinic. 
And I've been seeing some active duty patients that unfortunately very um, functional uh, can pass their PT test, cannot pass taping, right? Because they're a little bit on the higher side. Uh, and, um, and unfortunately I can't even offer them like obesity uh, medicine uh, treatment, not even surgery actually, give them medication to uh, treat some other conditions including obesity. And then uh, now myself going through the process separating from the army, I'm looking at the list of all these like, conditions that actually uh, one, you can actually get compensation once you get separated from the army. And second, then it will become a burden on the VA system if not treated uh, while we're active duty, especially diabetes. Once you become diabetic, uh, diabetic if you have to go on uh, oral hypoglycemics and eat, even insulin, you're automatically going to have to go through an MEB process and be separated from the army. So. Thank you so much. Dr. Suter, one last quick comment. Thank you. Well, Switzerland is certainly not uh, comparable to the U.S. regarding army and active duty. I've had the opportunity to operate on a few professional military personnel in Switzerland, and that caused no problem with the military at all, actually. Uh, a question I have for Dr. Walton. Uh, she talked about uh, science uh, that they want to allow bariatric surgery for the military. Is there any science to prevent it or not to support it? That's a question I have. I don't know of any science that says it's uh, so dangerous that it shouldn't be done. Yeah, I think that that's a, a very great point. And again, I, I only had 15 minutes to talk and there's so many excellent points that were brought up in this discussion. Um, I think that the 2007 uh, policy came down really before we've established many multiple military treatment facilities, center of excellence uh, with high rates of uh, bariatric surgery being performed. And so I think that it, it may have been based off of the general population uh, data about uh, safety of bariatric surgery, which we know now is so much safer uh, than maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, so I don't know of any data about people that have deployed, um, if they had a ruin Y for GERD um, and, and had difficulty like that. I did not find any information about that, but I think that that's an excellent point. Well, I want to thank everyone, Dr. Walton. Thank you for uh, leading the charge of this particular uh, part one of our section. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists uh, for participating and all of your wonderful and great comments. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shakora as he begins uh, part two of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, I'm actually very sorry. I, I'm unprepared to do part two. Oh, oh no worries. Well, um, uh, we were going to introduce uh, Dr. Buckwald uh, as we will begin, um, and I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Buckwald. We have, uh, he's going to be talking about metabolic surgery and the link between obesity and traumatic brain injury implications for the military. Uh, some background for Dr. Buckwald, as you all know him well, uh, professor of surgery and biomedical engineering at the Owen and Sarah Davidson Wangenstein Chair in, uh, surgery, uh, Chair in Experimental Surgery Emeritus at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, former president of the ASMBS, former president of IFSO, and served in the U.S. Air Force as the chief flight surgeon at Strategic Air Command Headquarters in Bellevue, Nebraska, U.S. And Gloria, if you would bring up Dr. Buckwald's slides, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, Dr. Buckwald, thank you. Good. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, or whatever we are at. It's my pleasure to give this talk and maybe to show a new insight into our field of metabolic bariatric surgery. The title is The Metabolic Surgery and the Link Between Obesity and Traumatic Brain Injury and Implications for the Military. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. The outline of what I'm going to speak about is a definition of metabolic surgery, definition of TPI or traumatic brain injury, TPI and obesity in the military, the link between TPI and obesity, the link between TPI and metabolic surgery. I'll give you a definitive reference. I'll talk about a window of opportunity 
and I'll talk about metabolic surgery intercession and the next step. Next slide, please. In 1978, Richard Varco and I published this book. Richard Varco, my great mentor, friend, wonderful surgeon. Next slide. In this book, we defined metabolic surgery as the operative manipulation of a normal organ or organ system to achieve a biological result for a potential health gain. Next slide. So let's look at some of the concept of disease as we go through the ages. The ancient Greeks believed that disease was caused by an imbalance of the four humors of yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. And this sort of persisted until maybe the 18th, 19th century, when in Europe, primarily by Rokotansky, great German pathologist, surgeon, said, no, disease is organ specific. So if you had a heart attack, it was the heart's fault. If you had an ulcer, it was the stomach's fault. But now in the 20, 21st century, we're getting back to a more holistic perspective. We're beginning to think of metabolic causes for disease, genetic causes, gut biomere causes, external environmental factor causes. Next slide. Now the prior disciplines of surgery, incisional, cut into an abscess, extirpative, take out a tumor, reparative, put in a heart valve, we're all focused on an organ gone bad, an organ afflicted with infection, cancer, trauma, or malfunction. Now, metabolic surgery is not focused on disease organs, but on putatively, and I say putatively normal organs, because we don't know what they're doing secretly. Are they emanating some sort of neurohormonal metabolic dysfunction? But we're operating on them because they appear normal, and we're trying to alter their anatomy, physiology, neurohormonal milieu to do something good. Next slide. Now, early examples of metabolic surgery. It was as early as about 1897 that people were doing oophorectomies for breast cancer metastases. So think of that. They're taking out normal ovaries and shrinking breast cancer metastases. In the 1950s and 60s, my start in the era of surgery, we were doing gastrectomies and vagotomies by the dozens. We were operating on normal stomachs, normal vagus nerves for a duodenal ulcer that we didn't touch, and yet it healed. The partial ileal bypass came out of Richard and my laboratory in 1962, 63 was the basis for the POSH, or Program on the Surgical Control of the Hyperlipidemias trial, a $65 million NIH tri trial, was the first study to show that lowering cholesterol by bypassing the distal third of the small intestine would increase life expectancy by decreasing atherosclerotic cardiovascular and peripheral disease, and actually on arteriography at zero, five, seven, and 10 years, we showed regression of atherosclerosis. It was the first trial ever to use metabolic surgery as the intervention modality. And of course, there's bariatric surgery for obesity, major metabolic surgery of today. Next slide, please. Traumatic brain injury. Let's look at that. It's caused by one major or two major or multiple smaller concussions. The diagnosis is clinical today, and there are four stages, cognitive impairment or thought impairment, reasoning impairment, physical impairment, headache, visual dizziness, nausea, loss of balance, mood impairment, depression, irritability, anxiety, and sleep impairment, obstructive sleep apnea. There is no signature marker for this disease today. There is no hemoglobin A1C. We make the diagnosis on clinical findings and autopsy findings. Next slide. Slide, please. Gloria. There we go. And there is no therapy today. We have palliative physical and mental exercises, which help maybe a little. And the prognosis, 
it progresses to CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is always at the end fatal. And many of these poor individuals commit suicide because they know what's coming. Now the risk factors that lead from TPI to CTE are elevated inflammatory markers from any cause, rheumatic, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, whatever, tumor necrosis factor, all of them accelerate the process. Cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk factors and obesity. Next slide, please. To show you what happens in the end stage, there's a normal brain and there is an advanced CTE brain from autopsy. Next slide. Now let's look at the military and TPI and obesity. Some of this data has been covered by Tamara, but I'll reinforce it. Today, 20% of the Navy is considered obese, 15% of the Air Force, Army, and Coast Guard, and only 7% of the Marines. The obesity trend versus 2015, 7% more likely to be obese, Navy 23% more likely to be obese, and senior officers 23% more likely to be obese. Thus, obviously, we got to take care of the obese and bariatric surgery as a means of doing that. Interestingly, in civilian life, females usually outnumber males, not in the armed forces, females 11%, males 16%, and it costs $1.5 billion. Next slide, please. Now, what causes this? Well, first of all, the incidence in the military is higher than in most civilian occupations. Why? Blast injuries, blunt trauma, and obesity is more prevalent in the veterans with TPI. Next slide. This is an interesting pie-shaped diagram that deserves study, but let's just look at the number here. Between 2000 and 2020, I mean 2000 and 2020, there were 434, 618 documented cases in the Department of Defense statistics of TPI. Next slide. Now, what's the link between TPI and obesity? Well, clinically, obese patients post-concussion have a greater incidence of and progress more rapidly toward TPI than the non-obese. And both obesity and TPI reduce cognitive and motor function. And this relationship is reciprocal. In other words, if you have obesity, you're more likely to get TPI. If you have TPI, you're more likely to become obese. They are very much related. Now, cerebral function is related in these two diseases as well, because obesity elicits the same cardinal manifestations of decreased blood flow, changes in neurochemistry, functional connectivity, gray and white matter volume, and microglia dysfunction. Next slide. Now, what's the link between TPI and metabolic bariatric surgery? there are at least 35 papers in the literature demonstrating beneficial outcomes in the cardinal symptomatology of TPI in patients treated with metabolic surgery, neurocognitive, physical, and mood function. So in other words, these individuals were operated upon for their obesity, diabetes, maybe hypertension, but they had incidental, let's say, TPI, but the TPI improved. Next slide. I'm not going to review these 35 articles, but I'll call attention to three of them. Marquis showed that at 24 weeks after metabolic bariatric surgery, cerebral metabolism in obese patients improved, as well as executive function, that means decision making, in association with favorable changes in metabolic and inflammatory parameters. Next slide. Thiera showed that in 10 out of 10 studies in a systematic review, he documented improvements in a neurocognitive domain after metabolic bariatric surgery. Next slide. And Alasco showed that metabolic bariatric surgery improves cognitive function for up to three years. 
Now that's very important because usually when we speak of follow-up of therapy, we speak five years, 10 years. But when you're speaking of TPI going to CTE, two to three years is the time between onset of significant symptomatology, suicide, or death from the disease. So if the improvement lasts for three years, you've done a lot. Next slide. This is the definitive reference I'm going to give you. It's from our group. We've worked very hard putting down all the stuff we could find. We have over 350 references. The first author is McLennan, and it's called Bypassing TPI, Metabolic Surgery and the Link Between Obesity and Traumatic Brain Injury, a review. You can find it in Obesity Surgery, three different issues, uh, 2020, December, going on to January and February 2021. Next slide. So I want to leave you with the thought that we have a window of opportunity as metabolic bariatric surgeons. Why? It usually takes years for the concussion effect to progress to first stage TPI. And it probably takes years of TPI before you get the irreversible changes of CTE. There therefore exists a window, maybe for up to 10 years of doing bad, of obesity, inflammatory markers, cardiovascular disease, accelerating this process. But that same window is a window of opportunity. It's a window to intercede, to prevent, to delay, arrest, and maybe even reverse TPI progression. Next slide. So what can we achieve? Well, we've already shown in 35 references that metabolic surgery ameliorates all four phases of TPI, cognitive impairment, physical impairment, mood impairment, and sleep impairment. In addition, we know that our surgery does many things that may be very beneficial. Decreases levels of inflammatory markers, increases adiponectin levels, elicits GLP-1 production, favorably alters gut microbiome, alters bile cell composition, and increases brain white and gray matter integrity. Next slide. So where do we go from here? Well, we are at the moment organizing a registry. And this registry will contain data from the armed forces, data from former NFL football players who have a remarkable, remarkably high incidence of TPI and obesity and cardiovascular disease. And if we have such a registry, we can do a computerized retrospective analysis. And if we keep up the registry, a prospective analysis. And then we're applying for a randomized controlled trial. There are currently no randomized controlled trials in this area. I said there are articles showing that metabolic bariatric surgery is helpful, but there is no trial. And so we will take a group of patients who are obese, have early TPI, and do a standard randomized controlled trial. And if this works, if we get an affirmative response, though it's in a unique cohort, the obese TPI patients, it will provide knowledge and impetus for non-obese TPI patients. Next slide. Final slide, I thank you very much for your attention. Here's our research group, you know, many of you know them. Walter Pores, our moderator, Eric, Archie Roberts, Tim McLennan, Eric DiMaria, Nin Nguyen, Jane Buckwell, thank you, and Rubmini Menon. Thank you ever so much, we can have the slides off. Well, it's a great presentation, Dr. Buckwald. It's certainly uh, something that none of us have ever discussed before when we talk to patients or to payers or to primary care physicians about the problems with uh, adiposity. And here you've opened up a whole new area. Let me ask the first question. Uh, with the battles that we've waged with the payers that you've waged for so many years as well, and trying to get them to cover diabetes or high blood pressure, 
How do you think they're going to react to now us coming to them and saying that uh, there may be a role for bariatric surgery with traumatic brain injuries or uh, you know chronic brain injuries? What's it going to take? Of course, everything that we've tried, I think we hold the record for opposition to progress. Uh, when transplant came in, they were opposed for a year or two. Uh, I was there in Minnesota in the 60s when open heart surgery came in. It was opposed. Congenital open heart surgery to correct, uh, correct coarcs of the aorta were opposed. So we'll have opposition, of course. But the idea that we're going to be helping DPI is as attractive as the idea that we're helping diabetes or obstructive sleep apnea. I think we have failed to convince the public to operate for obesity as a disease, but we have not failed and the realm is open to us to convince the public that we can operate for diabetes, hypertension, and now TPI. As a matter of fact, Eric can speak to that. Uh, he is starting to operate for TPI in the military on people who just happen to be obese. So it's a, it's a reverse of, of how we started. We operated on obese patients and said, aha, it cures diabetes. And now we can say we're operating on TPI patients. Aha, it cures obesity. And who's going to fund your trial if you can get a randomized trial going? Well, I hope it is the agency that is constituted to do this like the NIH. We're in the process of submitting our application. Eric, do you have any questions? Well, I'm obviously very closely involved in this effort. Um, and it is true. Um, I work with the Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic here in Germany. Um, and I've, after our publication, I went down there and we've talked and I've collaborated with them. And I've actually gotten referrals uh, primarily for the indication was traumatic brain injury. And the interesting part about that is like our surgical oncologist colleagues in the military, as Tamara alluded to, can do a gastric bypass for like a gastric cancer or severe GERD, and they don't get released from the military. They're allowed to stay on active duty. It's only the indication that changes the, uh, changes the status, which is a very interesting little piece. And so, and the statistics that they show, that Dr. Buckwall showed with 400,000 TBI cases in the military, and that's just the United States military. That's not all the other militaries that are represented here today. Um, that when we start talking about those sorts of numbers, that's a huge problem for the military. And uh, for us to be able to offer that for them, it's going to be far more attractive as a, as a treatment. So I guess not a question as much as just uh, praise for his efforts and his ingenuity. And it's the ingenuity. Yeah, that's for sure. I think we're going to now introduce the rest of the panel and Dr. Ortiz. You're up. Thank you, Scott. So uh, I'm going to start pre by presenting our second panel, and we're going to start start with Dr. Monique Hassan from the United States. She's a bariatric and metabolic surgeon at Baylor Scott and White Medical Center in Temple, Texas, United States. Uh, she's also assistant a professor of surgery at Texas A&M University USA and co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee ASMBS, Army Surgeon and Medical Director of the Bariatric Surgery Program at U.S. Army Fort Sill, Oklahoma, in the United States from 2013-2017. Welcome. I also want to present Mr. Evangelos F. Dimio from the United Kingdom. He's consultant bariatric surgeon and honorary senior lecturer at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital and Imperial College in London, United Kingdom. Also naval submarine director based at the Greek Navy from 1990 to 1992, deployed in the first Gulf War, chief physician, naval doctor in the Naval Hospital of Athens, Greece. Welcome. And uh, I also want to present Professor Stacy Brethauer from the United States, Professor of Surgery at The Ohio State University, Wexner Medical Center, United States, and former U.S. Navy surgeon. Welcome to all. And then uh, Professor Richard Patterson, United States Chief of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and Professor of Surgery at the University of Texas Health, San Antonio, United States, formerly active duty service in the United States Air Force. 
And I'm going to pass it on to you, uh, Scott, to present the rest of our. I have the honor of presenting the rest of the panel. I'd like to start off with Dr. Halid Aaron Taskin from Turkey, staff general surgeon in the Bay Coast State Hospital of Turkey, assistant professor of varicic surgery in Istanbul University uh, Medical School, secretary treasurer of the Turkish Obesity Surgery Society president of the Young Ifso, and a civilian surgeon to the U.S. and Turkish military based in Insulik Air Force Base, Turkey. I would also like to invite Dr. Angel Reyes, who we heard from before, a general and new invasive and barrageic surgeon at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington, USA. Welcome. Uh, Professor John Christensen from Norway slash Iceland, director of the Center for uh, Morbid Obesity and Barrageic Surgery, Oslo University Hospital in Norway, and uh, former vice president of the Norwegian Federation of Bariatric Surgery and Metabolic Diseases. And last but not least, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Anfeld. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel of the U.S. Army, thank you once again for your continued service, active duty since nine, uh, 2004, and serves as the liaison between the Defense Health Agency and ASMBS. So we can start the panel. Anybody have any questions for the uh, amazing talk that we just heard from Dr. Buckwald? Dr. I Shapira. want to make a comment if it's okay. Oh, please go. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, th thank you very much for the opportunity. I just want to make a comment. I think it's a very uh, unique concept that Dr. Buckwood is showed here because we are doing a study now uh, on behavior changes and cognitive behavior changes in obese subjects. And we are recruiting patients for the last two years. And uh, we are uh, preoperatively, we are taking MRI scans and EEGs uh, for the patients who are a candidate for sleep gastrectomy. And we are looking at the cognitive changes and also the behavior changes of these people. Actually, it's a thesis uh, of uh, in another university, a fellow in psychiatry and neurology department. I think there will be very interesting results because we are not just evaluating them for cognitive behaviors, but we are also looking at a, a psychological survey for these patients of how their behaviors also change in the time and also how their cognitive functions are changing. So I think because like obesity treatment is a multidisciplinary uh, approach is very important. I think we have also uh, do psychiatric and neurological evaluation on these patients and more studies on that uh, subject field. Uh, I hope I can share these results in six, seven months from now on. I think it's a very uh, evolving field also in military too. Mm -hmm. And just a quick comment, we have operated the US military personnel in 2006 with my father from Injilic base. And we did a mini gastric bypass actually on anastomosis to a pers personnel, but he was a private payer in the military. So I think nothing happened. And I, it just, just was an anecdote and he's doing very well in 15 years in US, living in US now. We are still following him up. Thank you very much. Thank you for those thoughts. We look forward to seeing that study. Dr. Hussein, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, um, Dr. Shakura, um, I did have a comment. Um, I thought that that talk was excellent, Dr. Buckwald. Um, I'm finding here in Texas, um, so I am very close to the VA. And so a lot of the um, referrals are coming from the VA for a lot of our um, veterans that are overweight and have multiple comorbidities. Um, but I yet haven't seen one that's been coming specifically for TBI. And we know that a lot of our veterans have that. Um, how do we get that information to the VA providers in terms of saying to them, you know, this is an, an, another indication for bariatric surgery, or at least a, you know, um, a indication for surgery. And then also in terms of their 
program that they have set up, they have this move program that has multiple steps, which is very similar to kind of our insurance carriers in terms of, you know, setting up these, you know, kind of roadblocks for our veterans um, to get care. Um, how do we help in terms of educating our providers in terms of that? Dr. Buckwald, so well, how do we educate the <laughs> Well, we've been trying to educate people for over 50 years. I mean, uh, Richard Varco did the first obesity operation in 1953. So we've been at it for over 70 years in the education process. And that's why I get back to what I was saying before. Uh, well, we failed with obesity. So uh, le let's concentrate on the effects of obesity diabetes, uh, and TPI. And I think that'll be a much easier education process because you have to just show the right people the progression of TPI, which only takes two or three years or so to CTE and these people dying or committing suicide or being uh, totally uh, mentally distraught, uh, being violent. I mean, this is a very easy thing to demonstrate. And when you have over 400,000 cases in the military, there should be enough cases uh, to be illustrative. Yeah, Stacy. Thanks, and thanks for a fascinating talk, uh, mm -hmm. as usual, Dr. Buckwald. Um, I have a question about your uh, potential trial. Um, you know, there's, um, some evidence in non-TBI patients um, that there's some cognitive improvement after metabolic surgery may, may be related to glycemic control, may be related to the fact that you mentioned. Have you considered putting in your an arm of non-TBI patients uh, in your prospective trial to see if there's changes unique to the TBI population or is it just a general improvement in cognition? That's an interesting thought. Mm. Uh, always interested in doing more science. If you obtain the money for us, we'd be glad to put in that extra on. <laughs> it, you know, it's always the question of how much can you do right. with how much you can get. And we're at the moment very interested in just showing that very basic thing that if you take patients who are obese and have TPI, you can approve the TPI. And then from there on in, uh, I think there'll be a lot of things that will uh, attach to that, many more trials, uh, many more thought processes, and, and certainly the extension from non-obese. Can you operate on non-obese patients and improve TPI? I mean, you know, we've shown you can do a, a duodenal switch on somebody who is barely overweight and they don't die, they just lose a little weight but it, it improves their diabetes. So why can't we do the same with TPI? And more important, maybe, we will elicit mechanisms and the mechanisms will teach us what causes this stuff in the first place. What are the neurohormonal differences that cause this to occur and therefore interfere with them maybe in a non-surgical manner? Great, thank you. I'd like to get everybody to speak while we still have time. Uh, Professor Christensen, what are your thoughts about uh, this topic? Well, in Norway, bariatric surgery is more or less paid by the public funding. And we follow the IFSO guidelines. So if the patients have, if the patient is a fire worker on BMI above 45, he will be offered an operation. But we haven't been, uh, we haven't thought that much about TBI. We did one study uh, unpublished uh, this year where we tested the visual and verbal on everyday memory in patients 30 days prior to surgery, after one year and after two years. And actually their memory declined the first year and was at baseline at second year. And uh, then we will test them for the third and fifth year. And what's your prediction? You, what do you think you'll see at three and five years? We hope it becomes better. The metabolic uh, 
profile is much better. So we hope that. But when you do bariatric surgery, of course, a lot of stress and strain. And a lot of patients are complaining about bad memory the first six, eight, 10 months after the surgery. Interesting. Has anybody else noted that from their patients, memory issues the first and second year after? Well, I, I can chime in and say that this is not a phenomenon that has, uh, it is a phenomenon that has been described in many patients with any major surgery. All right, so I'd like to, it may not be unique. I'd like to have Dr. Faniu um, comment. What did you think of the talk and any words of wisdom? I think it was a great talk. Um, obviously, Army, Navy, or Air Force is a very dangerous uh, profession, and injuries occur not only during active combat, but also during training and during routine activities. My question is, what is the medical legal frame to potentially deny people from a treatment that could either delay or fully reverse the progression of traumatic uh, brain injury? Because as I heard from Dr. Backfeld, there is accumulating evidence that that's the case. So potentially, US Army uh, denying to offer the treatment is a kind of Worms that the lawyers may quickly jump in to put their hands on. Thank you. And we were able to hear uh, his comments. Can you sort of abbreviate the comment? We couldn't hear you very well and see if it, we could hear you better. Be the medical legal frame when traumatic brain injury progresses, whilst there is evidence that there is a potential treatment that can delay or reverse these cases. I, I had trouble hearing you again. Did anybody hear that clearly? No. Is the, is the question why, what medical uh, reasoning does the military have for denying patients? bariatric surgery, um, despite evidence that shows that it's a progressive injury. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Did you hear that, Dr. Buckwald? <laughs> I'm supposed to speak of why they do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one. You're the yeah, responsible no. one. I, I, I don't take credit. For, I, I, what, I, what I say in my personal views, they do not represent those of the United States military or the government. Um, but however, I'll, I'll put in a, a side comment on that. Uh, when I was in, in the Air Force, I wasn't a surgeon. I was a flight surgeon. I did flying. I didn't do any surgery. And it was in 1958. And the SAC Strategic Air Command physical for flight status was very ri rigid. And if somebody came a pound overweight, they lost their flight pay. And so people said, well, Punishment is the treatment of obesity. And maybe that is even used today, but it's not true because to get flight status in the first place, these people could, didn't have to be obese, were mandated not to be obese. So uh, it, it, it's a paradox that may be used to keep people from having appropriate therapy. In addition, it's becoming a more and more hot topic. There was an article, one of the articles that Tamara referenced was one that came out from the New York Times saying uh, uh, too fat for service was, I think, the title of it. Yes. It, becomes yes. a, it becomes a national security problem when you have a service members that um, now can't serve in the military, can't do that. Our whole population, it's becoming a bigger an issue. And so now that's where Congress has started to become more eager to find a solution for it. So although I agree um, with Dr. Buckwall that we kind of missed the boat for, and also I think it's we missed the boat for treating for obesity as a disease, uh, certainly traumatic brain injury, marrying those two things up is gonna be very important. And I think Congress now has, with some of this data that's coming out of the RAND Corporation in 2018, um, shows that we actually have to start <laughs> start doing something besides kicking people out of the military because pretty soon we're not going to have a military 
if we just uh, find that as our solution. So such an interesting topic and so much that we don't know and so much that we're learning. Uh, I just, as a cynic, look at the payers, whether it's the government or the private payers, and I could just see them dragging their feet for eternity just so they don't have to pay for it regardless. And, and Dr. Buckle, you made that comment once we were discussing at some MBS meeting it's so obvious that diabetes gets better with bariatric surgery and these other problems get better. Why don't the insurance companies know this? We should educate them. And you made a very astute comment. You said, no, they know it. They know it better than we do, but they still refuse to cover it. And I wonder if that's the fear we're gonna have with looking at other uh, areas where we can uh, help patients such as chronic brain injuries. Oh, I, I think that's true for, for many. Well, it's, it's particularly true for obesity. Uh, about half of the population in the United States is very soon going to be obese or is on the road to obesity. So insurance carriers don't want to take on that burden. And uh, they have the best actuaries in the world. They got better statisticians than we have at any university. And they figure out it's not profitable. And if you look at what insurance carriers do, they take your money as an insurer and they invest it. Then they come on the Fortune 500 and they make money for stakeholders who are investors, not for you as a patient who gives them money, but for others who uh, give, give them money to, for, to protect you. But they make money from people who invest and gamble on the company. Exactly. So they're in business. Yeah, they're not in healthcare. That's a strong statement. Yeah, well, uh, when your article comes out, you, people will lock into what you just brought up because it's a very interesting topic. There was a comment from a surgeon in the Bahamas. How does the military feel about the balloon for weight loss? And I seem to recall in my area that the VA's covered balloons, but not the uh, not for active duty folks, of course. Eric, uh, any uh, experience with balloons? Yeah, I know. Actually, the Navy has taken uh, taken on the lead for balloons in active duty because the policy is written such that they can't have re uh, irreversible surgeries uh, for active duty um, that procedures. Uh, and this becomes a little bit of a gray line because you start talking about in endoscopic procedures like endo sleeves and things like that. Uh, become kind of interesting, but balloons certainly, with command approval, are are ha have been approved. Um, but there's, as the data has shown from a lot of the balloons, uh, there's not a whole lot of weight loss. So it's really become I have to pass my PT test or the 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 uh, anthropomorphic measures, uh, the tape, uh, the taping, and so that people will prescribe that. So they will cover that. Do you have any other uh, comments on that, camera? Yeah, I was going to say uh, the group at San Diego started doing um, intragastric balloon for active duty, and I actually looked for their, I know they presented at uh, Sages a few years ago, and I was looking to see if there was anything published on that subsequently, but I haven't found anything. We, when I uh, got approval for the intragastric balloon here at Walter Reed, we were specifically told by the command we could not do it on active duty. Uh, so it is command specific, um, and we're still working to try and change that policy. So it's not the panacea that we thought it was going to be. I have not seen a paper across my desk in obesity surgery about balloons in the military, but it might be a timely thing to put one in, particularly if you're getting even respectable results, because that may open the door to be able to use it more liberally. Any other comments on the topic or the the talk we heard earlier on uh, active duty people in the military having bariatric surgery. I think we have a few minutes left, right, Rich? Sorry, yes. I was on mute. We're, we're just, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Ortiz could probably tell us more, yes. A couple of more minutes, yes. Any comments? I have, uh, a, I quickie, I would... quickie. I have a quickie, quickie comment for tomorrow. Uh, there are positions today 
that are open, let's say, in combat commands for people who are disabled, such as the missile command. These people sit at a desk, but it's a combat command. Uh, and uh, so these things do exist. And, and uh, for instance, uh, SAC flies a lot of drones these days, and that's sitting at a desk. And you don't have to have the rigid requirements of having a flight physical. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the main goals with our amputee population is to be able to return them to full service. Um, and we have been able to do that, um, particularly with uh, 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 BKAs, uh, maybe not so much with AKAs, but uh, the goal is to always preserve the service if we can, if the, if the if the patient, if the soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, or now we call them guardians, right? Because the space force uh, <laughs> to, to preserve their service. It's interesting. I think one other comment um, is, as we talk about leveraging the government as a payer or seeing the government as a payer, it's uh, when when the big shift I saw come with. Uh, payers to pay for bariatric surgery was when we they realized the cost for diabetes was going to be um, less with bariatric surgery than it was going to be for lifelong diabetic treatment. Um, I think is that, and, and that's for diabetes. You know, everybody has a loved one with diabetes. I think it's much harder to ignore the TBI argument uh, because it's far more uh, extensive within the military as far as a, a an eyesore, so to speak, that they, these are primarily blast injuries or combat associated injuries, the vast majority, as Dr. Buckwell's graph shows. And so these are truly combat injuries that now we need to really be uh, treating. And so that's much easier to make, a, I think, a, an argument to Congress. Now, having the voice to Congress is going to be requiring, you know, there are certainly members of Congress that are, are victims of TBI. And to mention, to answer Dr. Uh, Hassan's question about how, um, how do you get, how do you reach across the aisle to talk to your VA, a TBA, TBI population? If you go into the TBI waiting room for the VA, you'll see that the vast majority of your patients are sitting there already without even the indication of TBI. And so in the MOVE program with the VA is also, it's, uh, it's, it's not required. It's very, it's the regionally required. So they, they have to have a program and the MOVE program is in place. And so they oftentimes, the VA will use that program as their program. But the wording of the VA is that they have to be part of a weight loss program. Um, and it doesn't, so Michigan does, the Michigan VA doesn't use the MOVE program. So that's just from the military working group or the military committee to come out of that, which covers the VA as well. So if you want more information, you can do that from the military committee. Do you anticipate any changes globally for bariatric surgery in the military? Uh, I know if the military decides they don't want to cover it anymore, they can just farm it out to the community through a champus like program, and then nobody's doing bariatric surgery in the military anymore. Do you see them supporting it and it growing, or do you see it being something that they, because of the volume, that they want to cut costs and they carve it out? Well, it's interesting because uh, we've checked, we've undergone this uh, transformation for the Defense Health Agency, right? So the Defense Health Agency is now managing a lot of these uh, hospital systems within the United within the continental United States, and now in Germany. And so, as that transition happens, uh, there's going to be different priorities between the combat arms who who uh, run the hospitals or traditionally have run the hospital, and now DHA, which is a far more business oriented. Uh, hospital uh, organization. And so I think there, there will be changes. I, I'm, I'm hoping, and, and as I'm advising to some of the people that are uh, for the DHA, that will, the military will continue to provide that service rather than farm it out to other uh, populations. Um, the other thing, there's a unique uh, network. So our population is very transient. And so every two or three years, our entire population turns over, they move different locations. And so that's become the challenge that um, it's easy to stay within our medical health record if it stays within the military. But if they go to outside providers, 
Um, then, then they're chasing medical records down from across the country that they've had, uh, you know, bariatric surgery in California. Then they lived in uh, New Mexico for two years. They didn't have any follow-up. And then they moved to the East Coast. They didn't have any follow-up. And now they're at a military facility. So Cameron, I'm sure sees that as well. I was just going to add that part of this is, you know, we talk about DHA that's running the hospitals, but we have to remember that the services own the active duty surgeons uh, who are doing this. And there is a little bit of a territorial fight uh, with um, what our primary objective is. And so I think that there is a lot of um, uh, upheaval now, and we're, we're really not sure where it's going to shake out because definitely in the Navy, there is some talk that we're all going to be trauma surgeons. And if you're not a trauma surgeon, we don't need you in the Navy. Uh, there's, there's some attitudes like that, which I hope does not come to pass, but uh, we're doing our best to say that we, our other non-trauma surgeon uh, uh, are very valuable members of the military health system. Yes, but um, even in my time, they were starting to farm a lot out to the community uh, as opposed to having surgeons at Wilford Hall doing the surgery there. And there must have been some cost savings involved, which is the only reason I could think of that they were doing it. Yeah, Dr. Shakura, here in Texas, we see, you know, we're adjacent. I'm at Scott and White, and so we're adjacent to Fort Hood. And so we get a lot of patients that have started the pathway and it's very common. They've started the pathway at Fort Hood, um, you know, met with the surgeon and then the surgeon gets deployed. And so now they are farmed out to, you know, Scott and White, um, you know, in order to take care of them, in order to do their bariatric surgery. Um, and then the real um, issue that we've been having is, this, you know, patients who have complications. So, you know, managing their uh, bariatric care um, when they've been all over um, in terms of getting records, like you mentioned, Dr. Onfeld, it's really difficult in terms of figuring out who did what um, kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we we would prefer that the sur that the surgeon you know, just send the patient directly to us and then we don't have to worry about some of that stuff. But um, but it is kind of difficult, especially as I was in the military, starting a program and then having every, you know, I as the bariatric surgeon deploy and then all these patients are now left in the lurch without a bariatric surgeon. It's, it can be frustrating. I think that's where the military can reach out to its its you know, like, like at Scott and White, the arrangement where if you have partnerships with your civilian uh, counterparts in that area, those can be established. And, and we do that in a lot of areas in the military with memorandums of understanding and uh, uh, use agreements uh, where we can actually uh, network and leverage our those partnerships. They're doing that for sure as far as trauma um, and doing these military civilian partnerships. And I think they could do that as well in terms of uh, bariatric surgery. And it seemed to be a two-way street also. In some cases, the cases went from the military to civilian. In other instances, it went from the civilian world to the uh, mil military. So, yeah, those can be very, I think, very reasonable. Yeah, I think, and actually, I think part of COVID has helped to create and foster some of those partnerships, um, especially here, because bariatric care was shut down at Darnall for a while and then, but we were doing, we were still doing it. So those patients were coming directly to us. Um, so I think that that's been one benefit of COVID uh, for us right now. Um, I would echo that Monique, uh, down San Antonio, same thing. We have our uh, similar relationship uh, with the uh, SAMC, you know, the, the Air Force and Surgery, uh, um, Air Force and Army put together um, and they were kind of shut down with COVID as well as the VA. So uh, we've actually taken on a lot of those patients. And my excitement is after hearing Eric's talk to our Texas bariatric uh, meeting uh, about the TBI, uh, not realizing that was even something at all, um, and, and the work he was doing, um, getting a lot of these VA patients who have that as part of, to your point, Eric, uh, they have the diabetes and the hypertension and everything else, but they have TBI as well. I'm excited to see how the TBI component of it improves with the surgery we're doing, you know, for their other current indications. So um, it's exciting to me to see this, this change and this move. Yeah, well, we're actually over time and I think uh, we need to wrap this up. I want to thank uh, the speakers for giving such great talks. I want to thank the panelists for such a great uh, mind bending 
discussion and the, the program directors of this, uh, Dr. Ortiz, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Um, uh, Eric. And uh, I don't know if there's anybody has any last thoughts, last uh, instructions, Ariel. Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, definitely a very, very interesting topic. We have over 3,000 live viewers at this moment globally. So I'm gonna pass it on uh, to my co-chair for some uh, quick closing remarks. Rich. All right, thank you so thank you so much, Ariel. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just excited to have been uh, invited to uh, co-chair with you on this uh, uh, exciting topic. It's uh, it's been a little while. I always have my heart at the military uh, from where I spent uh, my time, and so I do. Um, my heart always goes back to that. So I appreciate and I stay uh, very involved in all the military committees with ASMBS and. So I get to see all of my colleagues that we've worked with together over the years, whether it be SAGES or ASMBS, um, and working for the betterment of these patients. Um, and so uh, this, this field's evolving and we have to, we can't just sit there, uh, we have to actually make those moves forward. And I know it's not an easy process in the military, uh, but a lot of times when it happens, things, things fall um, and follow the military lead. So hopefully we can do that. So thank you all so much. I appreciate it. This is an amazingly distinguished panel uh, and group. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Ortiz for final closing remarks. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery production. I wanna thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. Register to obtain CME credits for this and upcoming events on cine-med.com forward slash IBC 2021. To view the complete Hot Topics in Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress has been rescheduled to September of 19 to the 21 of 2022. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now, let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor from IBC Global. Stay safe and God bless. My name is Luigi Boni and I'm full professor of surgery at the University of Milan and I'm currently chief of the Department of Surgery at the Polyclinical Hospital here in Milan. The CDGID system is a system that has been developed for fluorescence guided surgery. The CDGID system is actually is a step forward. First of all, it's an ultra HD system, so it allows you to have an ultra high definition. And the ultra high definition is maintained also when you're working in fluorescence guided surgery mode. And that actually is a big advantage because you do not compromise the quality of the image because you're using fluorescent surgery. So we're actually much more precise and precision in surgery means a lot. It means preserving structure that should not be cut, like nerves, preserving vessels, dissecting much more precisely, remove more tumor if you actually were performing cancer surgery. So I would say that the Synergy ID system allows you to perform a better surgery. Some other systems actually they have a little bit of a compromising and actually the, the image that we can obtain, uh, even uh, in 4K, they actually are a little bit more uh, artificial, they're a bit more contrast. Uh, personally, I prefer to work with something that actually gives you an image that is actually very similar to the real life. Definitely, I will recommend a, a Synergy ID system to other surgeons because uh, the, the quality of the image that you are obtaining are actually really good. Plus, you can customize the system according to your preferences. Each surgeon would like to have the color on a certain level, they have, want to have the contrast on a certain level. The Synergy ID allows you to do so. So that is a big advantage. The quality of the image is great, the fluorescence mode is fantastic, so I think it's actually definitely something to recommend. 
Well, I have to say the Artex was a real surprise uh, for me. Um, uh, was not really well known in, in the field of, of surgery, and I knew that they were actually a, a big company for the orthopedics. I didn't know as big as actually probably was. So the, I'm actually quite happy that I decided to enter in the field uh, of general surgery. The experience is very, absolutely very good. I can see a lot of professionalism going on. They listen to surgeons. That's something the surgeon like. Uh, to have a company that actually is listening to the surgeon, comes to our need and actually focuses their interest also, not just for the commercial point of view, but also for the surgeon point of view. So I think the overall experience has been very good.